uh, is um, the climate change uh, has no border. Okay? And we all, all citizens uh, need to, to, uh, to leverage all the different uh, uh, consequences of this, uh, this evolution. And um, if EU has a lot of capabilities in order to, uh, to support the production and delivery of some services, um, other regions have a lot of knowledge as well to share. So cross fertilization, mutualization on knowledge and asset could be really valuable to, to move forward. So um, the next uh, table will be moderated by uh, Marcus uh, Probeck, as director uh, and working at GAF. And, uh, as panelist, uh, Cecilia Donati, uh, Policy Officer Digital for Development at the DG INPA, European Commission. Benjamin Coates, uh, Head of Sustainable uh, Initiative Office and GDA Program at ESA. Giovanni uh, Seritella, Program Manager on Environment and Climate Change, Delegation of the European Union to the Philippines. And Meshak Kinua Ndiritu, uh, Space Application Training Officer at the African Union Commission. Marcus, the floor is yours. Thank you, Manuel. Um, welcome, Cecilia. Nice you. that you join me on the panel. And we have also the other panelists join online. Um, question to Ben and all the others. Are you here? Is Giovanni here? I can hear you loud and clear. Hi, Giovanni. Hi. And uh, Marcos, yes, this is Benjamin from Panama. I'm joining here with Carlos Khan, which uh, was not yet introduced. Thanks for confirming. Good that you're here. Meshak, also And this here. is Meshak from uh, Ethiopia, African Union Commission. I can hear you clearly. Excellent. Thanks for being here. So we have a bit of an unusual panel, just being two on stage here, but <laughs> I think everyone understands you pretty well. The sound is good. Uh, happy to have you here. So before we delve into details, let me just try and put the frame of this session a bit. We've heard quite a lot about um, policy this morning, about technology, now about um, the teams of uh, the vision of Team Europe in developing um, partnership endeavors, and now a lot about SDGs. Now let's try and move a bit more towards concrete actions and impacts. That's what this panel is about. And Let's see what we can find out also on the regional impacts, particularly in the several regions of the world that you are representing so, so nicely. So um, before we start with that, this all is about partnerships. Partnerships for addressing environmental and social global challenges. So from vision that we've heard before to action. So let, let me say I'm personally coming from private sector from a company. And of course, Europe has a lot to offer in that respect. Um, we have, let's say, the 25 years of Copernicus experience, and we've heard already about that. This is, of course, a huge testimony of operational services that are, have proven to be working, to be quality controlled in Europe, but partially also beyond. And there's a lot of offer that this can bring. Um, but th there's a lot of... Um, things to be considered, of course. Um, actually, we're not just talking when we are going to real applications just about Earth observations, but a lot also about geo-information, about concrete um, data and information put to action. And um, let's say th there is a lot of considerations that can be made, like still at the moment, um, most customers to private sector Earth industry is, of course, um, the public sector in Europe, but also worldwide. And of course, industry is always looking for new opportunities also in business to business, but this is still, let's say, underdeveloped in many respects, um, with, with a few exceptions, of course. Um, the, the interest is, of course, to use operational services, not just the research results that are certainly there in many respects, but to really go to operational things to also create benefits in the countries, in the regions, on a long-term sustainable manner. So it's not about projects and one-off funding, but it's about long-term implementation of a vision by concrete actions. So having said that, I'd like to give the floor to our panelists. And probably let's start with Cecilia, but then go in turn with everyone. Maybe just a short one-minute introduction 
tell us who you are, who you're working for, what your main challenges and endeavors are, and what role Earth observation can play in your daily challenges. Hello? Yes, very good. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, Marcus and Ersk, for having me here with you. I am Cecilia Donati, and I work for the European Commission, the department in charge of international partnership. So we are looking at collaboration, and as you said very well, partnership outside the EU. So we work with partner country, and we try to support them in reaching their policy goal, uh, which in this case can also be SDG target, for instance, because we all know and we heard it very well how earth observation can be useful in sustainable development. So our challenge every day is, I would say, to try and understand here from Brussels what are the main challenges around the world and how we can support them in building programs that are effective, efficient, and most importantly, that can be sustainable in the long future. Thanks a lot. Um, then I'd like to switch to Benjamin. What's the ESA perspective on, on that? Yeah, good morning from, from Panama. Um, yes, my, my name, as you said, is Benjamin Kurtz. And so my role as a sustainable initiative uh, head um, in ESA, the Earth Observation Directorate, we are looking at the kind of building long-term sustainable partnerships with our partners around the world. And um, yeah, you all know that we, we provide with Earth Observation global independent and transparent information for development cooperation. And I think that is also very visible here uh, across the, uh, the panel where we have, uh, yeah, basically everybody from, from, uh, from Africa to the Philippines and here to, to Panama with, with my friend Carlos Khan. And we, we really want to you know, be connected through space, uh, in particular to, with Copernicus. And I think uh, we would like to make the case, and we do it already for quite some time, that in development cooperation, where some of our long-term uh, initiatives are placed, um, we can use Earth observation to design, implement, and assess the impact of development cooperation investments. And uh, there we work with different actors like the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank as part of our Global Development Assistance Program, but actually also with many of the Earth's companies, uh, which you, you certainly have in the room. So um, that only makes sense if we use the Earth observation capabilities um, in the context of individual countries and transfer these kind of capabilities to their ministries can use it on, you know, to follow up the state of their resources and economic activities. And uh, here another partnership we really would like to take to another level is together with uh, the DG INPA where we have now a number of activities running and um, that really brings it to another you know, way how to work. Um, and just spent uh, the last day together with the European delegation as well who opens doors to work with the different governments uh, and that is here in Panama, and that is really making a difference. Uh, and you hear, I think, surely from Carlos and also from Giovanni more about that. Thanks a lot. Carlos, as you're sitting just right next to it, it's, of course, logical to ask you next. As you're representing the um, Copernicus Regional Center in Panama, what's your take on these concrete actions that can be done with Earth observation to help you in your daily work? Hi everyone, uh, thank you for having us here. Uh, my name is Carlos Ken. Um, I have four years in this administration and since November 2019, uh, we have been totally devoted on having Copernicus um, Regional Center established in Panama. Uh, we have built a strong relationship with the GIMPA, with the GDEFIS, but also because of all the projects and uh, to this pandemic, uh, we have collaborated with the GECO, GRC, and Sante on health. Uh, the air observation we observe as very transversal, not just only on, on the topics that are SDGs per se, and SDG probably is just a name, but it's more into, as most of, of the previous uh, statements, is, is a long term and how we can survive on this planet Earth and to sustain the future generations 
that will come. Obviously, the, the relationship with the European Union and, and this dialogue uh, pertains to us and another type of elements that probably we as technicians have not brought up at, at some point, but we believe that this um, technology has to uh, establish a legal interoperability with local and international jurisdictions in where uh, air observation data can actually overtake policy making process. And, and that is very transversal and probably my other colleagues from Latin America and the Caribbean and probably an African in Asia can concur with that. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot for the brief first overview of, of the um, perception from your side. Then let's go like in Euro Eurovision Song Contest. Now let's switch to the Philippines. Um, Giovanni, what can you tell us about your perspective of your regional um, challenges that you're facing? Right, well, Rula, uh, thank you very much for the question and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm actually at the moment in Italy, uh, but I'm uh, based in the Philippines at the EU delegation in the Philippines where I'm managing the Copernicus program for the Philippines. The challenges, uh, well, it took four years to, um, to come to where we are now, where we actually have a program uh, on the ground, we, together with uh, colleagues from European Space Agency. And uh, the, the main challenge we faced uh, early was, um, early on in the designing of this program, was the, the fact that uh, traditionally, and this is not only the case of the Philippines, uh, this is uh, the case of many countries in uh, uh, many partner, EU partner countries around the world, is that the traditional partner for these programs, uh, the government, um, tends to um, work on um, kind of isolated uh, standalone silos. Um, the various departments, uh, which are traditionally uh, important for uh, Earth observations applications, like the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, Science and Technology, for example, Agriculture, and so on. Um, forestry, they all tend to develop their own niche of uh, uh, technical skills and technology uh, um, and applications that seldom, somehow, seldom they, they like to, uh, uh, to work across these, uh, these boundary, artificial boundaries that they, they create. And this was uh, something that took some time to, um, uh, to break through. Uh, eventually we managed. Uh, now we have a very nice program nicely designed with uh, uh, two key uh, government agencies in the lead, the Philippine Space Agency and the Department of Science and Technology. And uh, the, uh, uh, the common denominator, I would call it, that managed to, uh, to, to, to bring around the table the, uh, the different agency is the fact that uh, the realization that the Philippines, as many other countries in the world are, highly susceptible to climate change and disasters. And therefore, if really the, the Philippines wanted to, um, to, to have a, a better response to disasters and climate change, they, they had no choice than uh, for the various agencies to come together and, and find a way, a tool, a t technology that would uh, help them to, uh, to cooperate and exchange data in a much more rational and uh, efficient way. Um, so again, this took some time. Um, eventually this, uh, uh, approach, initial approach in the Philippines will be replicated in other countries in, in, in the ASEAN region. You know, the 10 countries of ASEAN, Philippines is uh, one of them. And therefore, we think that we want to start uh, uh, somewhere and uh, eventually provide good uh, model that can be replicated across the region. Um, so this is one of the challenges uh, that we faced. Uh, the other challenge that um, we uh, are going to face uh, eventually is that the uh, um, private sector um, is not seen, not only in the Philippines, again, this is a, is a common thing that we see in many other countries, is not seen as, a, as a, a, a key element for a successful implementation of development programs. Uh, and this is something that our program will help, again, to overcome, because the private sector will be a, a key stakeholders across all the components of the uh, National Copernicus program. I will stop here. Th thanks a lot, particularly for the last statement. I think you're totally right. I mean, there is a lot of knowledge in the private sector that has been accumulated and 
established particularly in the frame of the Copernicus program, but also previous activities, and would be, of course, reasonable to utilize that as existing. Um, thanks for that. So now switching to MESAC from the um, African Union Commission. Um, what is the role of your organization? What are the daily challenges? What's the partnership um, recognitions and the role of Earth observation? Just as a first brief introduction. Thank you. My name is Misha. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes, very well. Yeah, speaking to you from Addis Ababa, which is the continental headquarters of our African Union Commission. Uh, I, I work as a space application training officer and while supporting uh, the African Space Agency that was recently created, we also have a, a program that is running and by coincidence is a collaboration between Africa and Europe called GMES and Africa and we're gonna dive into that as we go into the details. Um, well, traditionally the African Union Commission is just a policy driver and, and we did a lot of work to integrate uh, the development of the African space uh, policy and strategy into its working you know, daily activities. And so far we have reached to the level of creating the agency which now drives that policy and strategy. And it focuses on four main domains and Earth observation is one of them. Um, in Earth observation, what we have observed, and this is not again um, an isolated case of Africa, but uh, we, we started off from uh, situations where people were working in, in silos, the researchers on one side and then the policymakers on the other side and without proper communication or utilization of these services. And uh, breaking that barrier has been a big uh, undertaking for all of us. Um, we, when we started, for, for example, with different projects like uh, Mesa Puma and those that came uh, before that, uh, we found that you know, the research organizations which worked at the regional level or at the national level would stop at the product development, which means data and then, you know, packaging them into probably policy briefs and, and all that. Uh, and then we saw a gap that could be extrapolated to, you know, move from data or products to services. And that's where we see a lot of niche of the private sector coming in to add value uh, as someone said, for the last mile connectivity. And, and this is where we have been focusing a lot of energy with the GMES and Africa pro program. Uh, we started to move the mindset from uh, products to the development of services that can run and actually go to the last mile. The private sector integration into the ecosystem uh, is not something that was traditional. And also the integration of the academia was something that we introduced in GMS in Africa, which has now worked very well to uh, synthesize these services that can be integrated into uh, gadgets like the mobile phone through APIs and many other uh, ways of bringing the services to not only to the policymakers desk, but also to the uh, end user community. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. And I very much agree, as Mark Dowell said, that bridging of the last mile is indeed essential, particularly bridging also from research results and developments to the practical everyday implementation, obviously. Um, I think it's also more than just data and services. It's obviously also about building regional capacities, knowledge transfer, know-how transfer, um, um, institutional strengthening. So I think all this is essential um, in, in the process. So thanks a lot for the first introductory round. Let's try and have one further round of questions to everyone and let's try and be as concise as before and then I think we will manage in time. Um, so let's start, Cecilia, with you again. Um, my question to you would be, we've heard now a lot about collaboration and we've heard about regional focus areas like Philippines, like Panama, and obviously there's also new ways of collaboration now being sought and being developed. Um, what, what further plans does DG INPA have beyond that? So is, is there further ideas already on the table? Where's this gonna develop to? What do we see in five years time probably? Thank you, thank you for the question. Um, 
Let me start by recalling a little bit very quickly the context. We heard already from uh, Thomas, uh, Mr. Uzak earlier on uh, the, the political context we are working on. And so you heard about already what is Global Gateway. Global Gateway is uh, the EU global connectivity strategy and offer for our partner country. And it's about connectivity, it's about digital, it's about research, but it's, all, it's also about a comprehensive approach. So it, it's, it's also want to change a little bit the dynamic with respect to the previous way of doing things. Now we look into a stronger participation of the private sector. We are looking into the role of the banks and the risking uh, that the banks can bring in, in, this, in this program. We also uh, look into what is the role of the member state. So we talked about a team Europe approach where we really look into different partners being able to bring something on the table to have a better impact and a bigger project as well. Uh, because we all know that public money are not infinite, so we need to look for other solutions in this case. So if I look at the future, of course, uh, what, we, what is coming next, and it's very, very important, is, uh, you heard already, the summit uh, this summer uh, is the eu CELAC summit. Uh, this summit gives us the possibility of discussing at very high level and with our partner country, what where, where are the priority? And according to this priority, new program can come up. And so this, for instance, was exactly the same way. Uh, we are now um, trying to, we are now formulating the EU um, uh, Africa Space Cooperation Flagship. Uh, there is a summit outcome from the EU-AU summit of last year. So we look into an holistic approach, as we said it before, an integrated approach. We look into uh, a replicable model that need to be adjusted in the different region, but build on similar pillar. So we look into, uh, we start from, uh, from government and dialogue. So we want to establish a dialogue with our partner country in order to sure, ensure sustainability of the, the partnership and the program. We look in, into infrastructure, so we talk about data ecosystem, data infrastructure, cables, a strong infra data center, uh, and so on. We look into development of skills, so capacity building, raising awareness, uh, support partner country in being able to uh, be autonomous in, their, in, in reaching their goal and developing services that are according to their needs, that are not per se, our need might be different, and we might have much to learn from them as well. So it's, it, it, it must be a win-win partnership from two sides. And last part that I think it's interesting for the audience here is the role of the business. So of course, it's about supporting local ecosystem, but also supporting our uh, capacity and know-how whenever it's possible and whenever there is a match between demand and offer. And if that works well, it will be win-win, obviously, for everyone. Indeed. So, thanks for that. We hope it will be win-win yeah. for everyone and thanks. for all parties. Thanks for that longer-term perspective. Let me switch back to Ben um, and trying to be delving into more concrete detail now. Um, we've heard about the Copernicus Regional Center in Panama, but also in the Philippines. Um, it's about joining forces for better response. We heard already about particularly natural disasters and response to climate change, um, risk reduction and preparedness. Um, so what, what difference does Earth observation make there? What, what's the implementation steps foreseen in the centers? What's the, what's the concrete envisaged procedures for data access, ownership? What can be done with what is developed there? Can you give us a bit more detail? Thanks, Marcos. Yes. Um, how should I say that? Yes, I do believe um, what we would like to do here in this context is to develop sustainable growth in the different countries and regions we are working with. And uh, we have now here really three different continents uh, uh, around the table. And I would like to go through all of them uh, by just giving some examples how we, we can make these things work. I believe what we need to achieve here is um, empowerment of the different actors through ownership of these activities. Huh? So we all know that uh, Copernicus and Earth observation is very global, but the impact needs to be done on the local level. And for that, we need to have public institutions and private sector in the different countries being activated and engaged on really owning these type of uh, capabilities. And uh, for that, 
we, we facilitating the setup of Copernicus data centers in, in the Philippines, and Giovanni will talk about this in detail. And here as well in Panama, together with Eiffel and Carlos, we go also in more detail for really going across the, the lag region. Only that is not sufficient. We need to actually also develop around it some capacity in terms of using this information and as well the, the EU services development on top of it, enabling local communities and, and ecosystems around it. And that includes the private sector. In Africa, we already look uh, back on more than 20 years of collaboration with the African Union uh, Commission and MESAC is, is a long-term collaborator for that, uh, as well as the African Earth Observation mm -hmm. Community in terms of research and development. Um, and then here we have the, the you know, we had the Tiger Initiative, but now also very strongly the EU Africa initiatives, which are bringing a lot of uh, research and development type of activities supporting GMS in Africa. Just very some concrete things here. What is happening as an example in in Panama, um, the Latin American and Caribbean region. We, we just yesterday spent some time together with uh, the different uh, governmental agencies. We, we met them. Vice Minister um, of uh, Foreign Affairs who's supporting this, uh, but we also, most importantly, we went on the ground to look at offices where this center can be placed. Uh, we will meet this afternoon, the data center where we can uh, host the information. And um, all that is only possible because we have this kind of funding together with DG Infra to in invest in this kind of activities. Um, and the EU delegations, just like uh, Giovanni in Philippines, is opening us, as I said already before, um, the doors. And um, that will lead up to two big tenders, which either will be procuring through our normal uh, procurement rules, but will be funded by DG Infra. And we are planning to publish that within two weeks, two to three weeks' time, by one on knowledge development, capacity development, and the other one on EO services co designed with the different uh, um, partners and risk resilience and reduction. Most importantly for that, I really want to stress this here because I think we are having an interesting community online. Um, is they are all eligible um, from European and as well from Latin American and Caribbean countries in the case of the Latin American and so the Copernicus LAC Center, let's say. And so we really explicitly encourage international teams to bid for this. And so I really know that there are already some people trying to, uh, to do that, but I think it's a very good platform here to announce and to make this uh, work. And thanks to Earth, we have this kind of connections. In the Philippines, we're looking at a very similar type of setup, but it's more national. And Giovanni already mentioned it can go regional, but I mean, one step by a time, I, we need still have to do something in the Philippines. Working with Pilsa, it's amazing. Um, institution. I was there like a month ago and really very young, very innovative, very strong. And there as well, we would like to um, open and we'll be consolidating together with the technical assistance in the moment, the requirements, and then very soon afterwards, we'll follow tenders um, to implement that together with US industry. Um, so that uh, will be another concrete step forward to, to work on it. And then finally, in Africa, we, we have been working with Cecilia and, and other colleagues to, to prepare the you know, from the summit last year to prepare the African Space Flagship. And here, obviously, we see big opportunities to work together with UMSHAC on the emerging African Space Agency. The ESA and African Space Agency the, are the only uh, regional space agency in the world. And I think there's a lot in terms in common, and we can work on things to make uh, you know, bigger synergies and leverage these. But I also see here a high potential to, to be untapped in the private sector, um, which is, has been shown by the, by the recent new space conference in Abidjan, but also interest from, from different countries we have been receiving, for example, from Rwanda, to host incubation labs. And we're happy to, to think about how we can do these kind of things together to leverage the private sector in Europe and in as well in Africa. And I stop here. I think there's much more, but. I'm happy to hear also my co-panelists on these yeah. things. Thanks, Ben, for that deep insight. Um, I think many of the audience and also of the online attendants will be interestingly have heard about the tenders coming up. Of course, that will be interesting for several of the community. Um, looking forward to. And um, 
now, Carlos, from what you've heard and from what you know and, and envisage to, to happen, how do you think that this international cooperation can really support in Panama and in the region the future emergency resilience and particularly what benefits do you think and which kind of boost will it bring to Earth observation community, also, also private sector in your region? What's your perception? Hi, hi again. Um, yes, thank you. Well, um, this is very interesting because um, I, I believe that the pandemic has brought us uh, an enormous tension and put us on very innovative and creative ideas on how to survive. That's, that's a fact. And how the scientific community and also how also the strategic and the political floor are using this intelligence brought up by their observation is navigating in, into their mindset. And it's very particular that we have, for example, in, in the Vice Ministry of Environment, she used uh, Copernicus data to establish a new uh, forestry and land of, um, use of land map that it was quite impossible in using data a couple of years ago. So now the, the maps are being updated from 10 year span to a two year span. That's a quantum leap. Yeah. And obviously how these maps are being used by other type of institutions towards agro policies, uh, terrain policies, and also now that the, the institution for tropical disease research, the, the Gorgas Memorial Research and Lab, has been um, more focused on having sonetics research with the health uh, vertical. And that is quite amazing how this international collaboration using the air observation can respond to the complexity that we are living now. And, and obviously this international cooperation will deliver, uh, as you mentioned, knowledge transfer, the, the know-how transfer, but also the technology sharing. That's uh, a, a driving force for Latin American countries and also the Caribbean, and also the opportunities towards the financial support and other mechanism of investments are also very, very well. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I mean, th that is very concrete value that you describe for, for regional policy making also, because having information that is being actionable, of course, provides a lot of opportunities to, to act then. Thanks a lot. Um, let's move to Giovanni. Um, we've heard from you before about the ambitions also for the Philippines and how to potentially expand that uh, regionally in, in the future. So what's your perception? How can this happen? What's the envisaged progress from being a national mirror center for Copernicus, for Copernicus data, towards being a regional one, what's the envisaged implementation stages, what's your vision on that? Okay. Well, uh, as Ben rightly said, we, uh, we have to start first in the Philippines, but that's what we're doing. But because the uh, procedures and the uh, um, formulation of new programs in the Commission is a very lengthy process, that's why we're already starting now formulating, uh, designing, the, the future of the uh, Copernicus program that we are starting in the Philippines. And we have to do that because uh, we don't want to have a gap between the two initiatives, meaning that the Copernicus program in the Philippines is a three-year program uh, starting this year, uh, or started already this year. And um, by the third year, at the end of the third year, we should be in the right position to uh, uh, continue uh, the, um, and build on the, on the national program in the Philippines, uh, scaling it up to, uh, um, to, to a regional level in ASEAN. Um, so progress is actually made as we speak. Uh, we, are, we have um, 
uh, now, uh, right now, a formulation process going on for this uh, uh, for this uh, future phase. And traditionally, um, the ASEAN countries they pride themselves uh, of. Uh, to excel in some specific areas, uh, whether this is uh, uh, services or communication technology or uh, response to disaster, sustainable forestry, and so on. In some cases, uh, this is actually a, is, is a constructive and positive uh, spirit of competitiveness between countries. Um, so by starting in the Philippines, the Philippines will be the first in the region among the 10 ASEAN member states uh, to host and establish a, a mirror site, a data center, that it's been called uh, during the, the previous uh, interventions. Um, and it will be the first also in the region to, um, to sign a, um, uh, a data exchange cooperation arrangement between uh, the commission and, uh, and the partner country and, and the government. Um, this would grant preferential access to Copernicus data in terms of resolution, coverage, and speed of data acquisition uh, uh, for, the, for the Philippines. And in this context, um, this will be a nice example that other member states in ASEAN would want to replicate and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and learn from. So, uh, as I said, we, um, we are now starting in the Philippines um, uh, with, uh, with uh, the first component, because the, component, the, the program in the Philippines will have three components. One will be a, an infrastructure component, which means the establishing of this uh, mirror site. There will be an uh, application development component, which will actually be um, uh, developing scalable pilot uh, projects that will demonstrate applicability of Copernicus data in areas of uh, national interest. And then there will be a capacity building component and, um, and there will be uh, opportunities for uh, know-how and uh, academic uh, and knowledge transfer between Europe and the Philippines. So we, we cover uh, the, uh, the, the spectrum of, uh, of uh, uh, cooperation with the, with the Philippines uh, quite, quite well with this program. And this will be a possible model that will be replicated in other countries. Um, so again, we, um, we start uh, with a small program, it's, um, uh, it's a strategic program, it's a 10 million euro, it's not a massive amount of money, but it's strategic as it's important to, to make this uh, amount of uh, resources uh, strategic and uh, well used, um, with a view to have a much larger uh, uh, undertaking, uh, my colleague Cecilia already mentioned it, is Team Europe, under the Team Europe initiative, there will be a much larger, a more important, substantial uh, engagement of individual member states, uh, EU member states, um, in order to, um, to address uh, digital connectivity and uh, 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 the larger infrastructure that would enable uh, Copernicus data to be much more effectively exchanged, not only within national boundaries, but across national boundaries in the region. All right, thanks a lot for giving that additional vision. Um, very interesting to see how this will develop. We'll closely observe and accompany the process for sure, all of us. Um, so Meshak, last but not least, um, further question to you from all that you've heard now from the colleagues from the other region. Is there specific aspects you'd like to add more from, from the African perspective? We've heard there's a long-standing collaboration, particularly between Team Europe and Team Africa. There's also an existing Copernicus cooperation agreement with the African Union Commission. Um, so, but what's, from your perspective, additional and specific to be added, maybe? Yeah, thank you. In fact, I was following uh, keenly on the discussion because uh, Benjamin will remember some time we started working on how to distribute these data centers on the continent to allow preferential access to the Copernicus data uh, in Africa. And uh, at some point, you know, we did some testing and I believe some work is still going on to uh, select some of the sites for uh, the Copernicus preferential data access, uh, allowing for, you know, more uh, robust services to be developed. Uh, but just like it was said in the beginning, uh, probably to approach it from a, a high level point of view, 
the a new approach and the new uh, collaboration is focusing on Africa, Europe, uh, co collaboration in space and not particularly on Earth observation. And there are many reasons for this because, as I mentioned, uh, the creation of the African Space Agency is uh, changing the dynamics on how uh, we view collaboration uh, from this uh, point of view. And, you know, the African Space Agency is mandated to... Uh, not only to coordinate, but to implement some programs that will be of interest to both continents. Um, and this means that we are interested not only on the downstream verticals, but we are also looking at the upstream sectors as well. Uh, and, and this is uh, inevitable because uh, we are seeing a lot of convergence of different technologies that is helping in removing some of these uh, uh, domain artificial boundaries, which means that many sectors are domains of space might be working together uh, and in the future we foresee that uh, probably we will not be treating other observation in isolation. Now um, going further from that we uh, as, as I said we have a uh, you know long-standing cooperation with uh, European Union and particularly also with their uh, technical institutions and uh, not excluding ESA. We have had a lot of uh, collaboration with ESA recently, not only in GMS and Africa, but in preparation for this Africa-Europe uh, collaboration in space. Now, we, we have learned one or two lessons from GMS and Africa implementation in the process of uh, uh, doing this collaboration. And uh, one of them, like I said, we integrated the private sector into the uh, ecosystem of Earth observation projects, which was not traditional. Uh, through GMS in Africa, we have created a network of about 150 institutions, which are national and regional. And this huge network has been working collaboratively for the first time, uh, involving the entire continent in a synergetic manner of uh, developing services. Uh, we focused on... Uh, marine and coastal area services, and then uh, water and natural resource services as the first um, implementation of, of uh, the priority of implementation. Now, what we have done, we have also created a network of academia, which is very important for the skill revolution and, and creation of that continuous skills uh, needed on the continent uh, to continually prepare uh, the population or the technicians or uh, the researchers on the new emerging technologies and the particular focus now is actually to um, uh, take advantage of emerging technologies like uh, cloud computing uh, with the massive data set that are coming uh, from not only the Copenhagen side but you know, merging with other data points from uh, different sources um, which leads to the con uh, you know the rationale of putting together these uh, data centers on the continent uh, because we have seen a lot of demand for data on uh, in Africa to develop different services and different products. But uh, due to the challenges that are uh, faced in different parts of the countries, we are talking about 55 uh, member states of the continent which have different and uh, variable uh, challenges that need to be handled um, case by case, but uh, when it comes to the internet connection, we see a uh, common trend of um, the low bad wind of access to data, mm -hmm. which then you know, led us to having that conversation with ESA on how to establish uh, those data centers that could facilitate ease of access. But not only that, uh, building uh, cloud uh, solutions that could allow um, only the downloads of essential services or products that are more synthesized uh, to uh, free the bad with and allow as many uh, as possible institutions to have access to that information. So I would say uh, in order to you know, effectively address the cross-border issues that we are facing like climate change, uh, disaster risk reduction, ETC, um, on both continents, I think the next Africa-Europe engagement should look at all this holistic spectrum of space um, and including other dependent technologies like, you know, IT and many other sectors that will uh, facilitate the development of uh, services on both continents. We are talking about the rising, you know, uh, space economy on the continent, which is expected to be in the northwards of uh, 20 billion by 2025. And this is very important because it shows a lot of interest from 
uh, our own member states of developing the space sector. There is a significant budget that is being invested by different countries on, on space, and most of it goes actually to Earth observation, which implies, again, there is high demand for EO applications across many public and private sectors. And um, during a study that was done by Digital Earth Africa and, and the World Economic Forum, it showed that the value of uh, Earth observation and the digital uh, and the digital technologies could be the northwards of uh, $2 billion a year, uh, boosting productivities in, uh, in agriculture, which is the main mainstay of the economies of many countries on the continent, to saving uh, environmental damages that actually emanate from many other, uh, many sources like, you know, illegal mining and so on and so forth. So I, I see a lot of opportunities that we can work together here to actually uh, have mutual, bene mutually beneficial opportunities on both continents. Okay, thanks a lot for your holistic view, actually, and the recommendations which are certainly being heard. Um, with that, I'd actually like to thank the whole panel. I think it's been an interesting experience for all of us here having this hybrid format. I think it's been excellent to have participants from all over the world that shows indeed the ambition for collaboration nicely. Uh, in a very direct way. Thanks a lot for all the participants. Thanks for all the audience for bearing with us in this after lunch uh, difficult time. Um, I think th this is a format that we should probably repeat in the future. I think it's been very worthwhile to hear all the different views and the recommendations from all over the world. Thanks a lot and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. But